everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly if you are new around here if you have never seen my face on your screen before then hi my name is molly and i post true crime videos like this every single week so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for then please do subscribe and don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that youtube will let you know whenever i post a new video this week we are going to be talking about the solved case of becky watts now this is a case that I've been intending to cover pretty much ever since I started my channel because it happened not too far from where I live in the southwest of England and I vividly remember seeing this case all over the news. It was all over the news, all over social media. I remember watching the TV appeals and sharing Becky's missing posters on my Facebook and I remember watching this whole case unfold and how just truly insane and heartbreaking it was. When Becky went missing in early 2000 2015, a huge police search quickly ensued to try and find her and of course everyone was praying that she would be found safe and well but tragically that isn't what happened and it came as a complete and utter shock when people found out exactly who was responsible for this horrific crime. But just quickly before we get into the case I would like to say a massive thank you to Audible for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. I've been an Audible member for probably years now. I use their service pretty much every single day and I'm just obsessed with them. They have such an incredible huge selection of audiobooks across so many genres from bestsellers and new releases, celebrity memoirs, motivation, wellness, business, mysteries and thrillers and even more. When you become an Audible member you are given one credit every single month and you can use this credit to purchase any title in the entire premium selection and that title is then yours to keep forever. And as well as audiobooks, members also get access to the thousands of podcasts that Audible has to offer from popular favourites to exclusive new series. And the Audible app makes it super easy for you to listen to either your favourite podcasts or audiobooks anytime, anywhere. Whilst you're travelling or at the gym or out on a walk, I use the app a lot when I'm actually getting getting ready to film a video. Whilst I'm setting up all my equipment, like my camera and my lighting, I'll just pop on an audiobook in the background. An audiobook that I listened to this month and highly, highly recommend is actually a book about this case, about Becky's case. It's called Becky, the heartbreaking story of Becky Watts by her father. It was written, obviously, by Becky's father. His name is Darren and his account is so devastating, but it was also so, so informative. I refer to the book a lot throughout this video actually because of course Darren knows more about the details of this case than anyone so yeah I highly recommend you guys check that out I will leave Darren's book linked in the description box as well as a link to the Audible website if you go to audible.com forward slash molly or you text molly to 500 500 you will be able to get a free 30 day trial again thank you so much to Audible for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel thank you to you guys for always supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. So for this week's case we are going back to early 2015 in Bristol which is a city located in the southwest of England and this is Rebecca Marie Watts or Becky as she was often called by friends and family. She was born on the 3rd of June 1998 in Bristol so she had lived there all her life. Her mother was called Tanya Watts and her father was called Darren like I said Darren Goldsworthy. Becky had an older brother named Danny. Tanya and Darren had him in 1995 so he was about three years older than Becky. However by the time Becky was born Tanya and Darren were no longer together. They had separated and for the first few years of Becky's life she lived with her mother Tanya with her big brother Danny. But the two siblings would visit and stay with their father Darren every single weekend. However when Becky was just three years old she and Danny were actually taken into care by social services because there were concerns that perhaps they were 
weren't being looked after well enough at home and their father Darren decided instantly that he wanted to fight to get full custody of both of his children. He wanted them to live with him full time and in March of 2002 after a long battle that is exactly what happened. The family court granted him full custody alongside his new partner Angie. Angie and Darren had known each other I believe for a number of years before they eventually got together. There had always been that spark between them but I think it was often a case of right person wrong time. However when Becky was I think around two years old they properly started seeing each other and they quickly fell in love. And during the whole custody situation Angie was always there for Darren right by Darren's side doing everything that she could to support him. From what I can gather even though Darren won full custody of Danny and Becky the kids still saw their mother Tanya often. Becky still had regular contact with her mum right up until this case took place. She just wasn't living with her anymore. At three years old Becky was obviously now living with her father Darren, her older brother Danny and her father's partner Angie. And Angie had a child of her own too, a son named Nathan, Nathan Matthews. Angie had Nathan with a previous partner although Nathan had no contact with his biological father. So when Darren came into his life he kind of became that father figure and Angie became another mother figure to Danny and Becky. Now Nathan didn't live with his mum Angie, he actually lived with his grandparents but he was still very very close to his mum. So when Angie became a stepmother to Becky and Danny, Nathan became their stepbrother. And Nathan was quite a bit older than both Becky and Danny. He was about 11 years older than Becky so he was in his early teenage years when the two families kind of joined together and he got on with them well enough. Nathan and Danny would often hang out and play video games together. Nathan definitely liked Danny more than he liked Becky. I think because Becky was obviously the youngest often she was the one to get the most attention from the parents Darren and Angie and it's been suggested that Nathan did often get quite jealous of that. So he wasn't always that keen on Becky but it's safe to say that Becky always adored him. She really really looked up to him as her older brother and as it turns out the first word that she ever spoke would actually be Nathan. For the most part this now family of five seemed to work well and Becky had a pretty normal happy childhood. However fast forward to her early teenage years and they were not so good. Becky really did not have a good time in her early teens. She really struggled at secondary school because she was always a very very shy girl more so when she was out of the house in the house with her family with Angie and Darren she was the complete opposite she was loud and feisty and bubbly because she was obviously so comfortable with them but when it came to meeting and mixing with new people she found that really really hard she found it hard to make new friends because she was so timid and this of course wasn't helped by the fact that she was also picked on a lot in school her father Darren said that she was often just teased and bullied by these nasty groups of girls. They would just make fun of Becky. They would make fun of how she looked. They would comment on her weight. They would steal from her. One time they stole this brand new jacket that Becky wore to school. And although her parents, Angie and Darren, went to the school and they asked the teachers to look out for Becky, the bullying didn't really stop. And as you can imagine, it had such a huge impact on Becky's mental health, especially the comments about her weight. She had been told that she was fat and ugly so many times by these horrible horrible girls that she started to believe them. She believed that she needed to lose weight and so she started restricting her food. She would only really eat these low fat ready meals and even then she wouldn't eat the whole thing. She was weighing herself constantly. She got to a point where she was hardly eating anything at all. So she had no energy. She would often feel dizzy and she would even sometimes faint. She was over exercising and just getting thinner and thinner and thinner and of course Darren and Angie were so worried about her so they got in touch with the doctor a few times I believe and eventually Becky was referred to an eating disorder and mental health facility where she was diagnosed with anorexia and at the time she was just 12 years old and over the coming months thankfully she did start to put on weight. Her weight got so so dangerously low at one point that she almost had to be admitted into the eating disorder facility. But over time she slowly started eating more and more and by age 13 
14, she was back at a healthy weight again. And as her eating started to improve, so did her anxiety a little bit too. As I said, she was a very, very, very shy girl and she really struggled with social anxiety. But over time, she did develop a little bit more confidence. And when she got to year nine of secondary school, she actually became a mentor to some of the younger year seven students. Becky would always look out for them. She would check if they were okay. She would check that they weren't being bullied because obviously she could relate to that. She was bullied so badly herself and she didn't want anyone else to have to go through what she did. Her dad, Darren, said that she was even given an award by the school for being the most kind-hearted student. When she was 14, Becky actually got moved to a different school in Bristol. It was called the Bristol Hospital Education Service. And the reason she was moved was because during the time when her eating disorder and her mental health was at its worst, she missed so many school days because, well, number one, she would skip school because the girls there made her life a living hell and she didn't want to go. And number two, often she was just way too ill to go in. She was so weak from where she was hardly eating and over-exercising that she just couldn't go. So she missed a lot of school during that period of her life, which meant that she kind of had to catch up and make up for it by attending this other school, which was specifically for children who had missed a lot of education due to serious health issues. And her experience at this school was completely different to her old one. She actually really enjoyed being at this new school. There were no more bullies. I imagine she got so much more support from the teachers. She made some new friends. She even started dating. She started seeing this boy called Luke, who Darren said was really, really lovely and polite. So things were really looking up for Becky. In August of 2013, she had the exciting role of being a bridesmaid at a wedding. Her dad, Darren, and his partner, Angie, had decided to get married. Angie had unfortunately been diagnosed with MS, I believe just two years prior to this, and this diagnosis really, really, really took its toll on her, as you can imagine. In case you are unfamiliar with MS, it stands for multiple sclerosis, and it's a condition that can affect the brain and spinal cord, which can result in problems with eyesight and balance and movement, etc. So that was a really, really hard time for the family, having to come to terms with that diagnosis. And afterwards, Darren decided that he he just wanted to marry Angie finally. He described in his book how he wanted to throw a huge event to get all of the family and friends together and just have a wonderful day. So the wedding took place at the end of August in 2013. Their sons, Danny and Nathan, both shared the role of best man. And Becky was a bridesmaid alongside one of her cousins and also her stepbrother Nathan's girlfriend, who he had been with since around 2008 time. Her name was Shauna Hall. And by the looks of it, it was a really nice day. Becky had a great time and she looked absolutely beautiful in her bridesmaid dress. And after the wedding, life for Becky carried on as usual. She was still attending school. She still had her boyfriend, Luke. She was still seeing friends. Everything, everything in her life seemed to be going fine, which is why it was such a massive shock when in February of 2015, 16-year-old Becky Watts seemed to just suddenly disappear. The day was was the 19th of February 2015 and that day it was actually Becky's older brother Danny's birthday although I don't believe Becky or the rest of the family really had any plans with him that day. Apparently he was spending it with friends at a party so all in all the day began just like any other would for Becky. That morning Becky was at her home where she obviously lived with her dad Darren and stepmom Angie. They lived on a road called Crown Hill in St George in Bristol. Darren went to work early that morning so for a while it was just Angie and Becky in the house until eventually Angie was picked up by her mother and taken to a hospital appointment. Angie was out of the house for about two hours that day, just under two hours. She returned at around 12.45 p.m and when she did she found that her son Nathan and his girlfriend Shauna were in the house. They had popped over and used a key to get in, a key that was always left outside for them. Nathan and Shauna 
Anna were there just watching TV in the living room, but Becky wasn't. She wasn't in the house. It seemed as though she had gone out. And Shauna did mention to Angie that I think not long after they arrived at the house, she did hear the front door slam while she was smoking a cigarette in the garden. And she just assumed that that was Becky leaving because she would often slam the door shut, probably just accidentally. So Angie just assumed that Becky had decided to go out for the day with a friend, something that she would do often. And she was a 16 year old girl, so she was trusted to go out on her own. However, a couple of hours after this, Becky's boyfriend Luke arrived at the house. He knocked on the door and he just asked if Becky was there, if he could speak to her because he had been sending her some text messages and she just hadn't been responding. The last time she replied to him was around 11 a.m. and then the text from her just stopped suddenly, which he thought was weird because I think Becky was usually quite a speedy texter. Anyway, Luke popped over, he asked if Becky was home, but of course she wasn't. And Angie told him that as soon as she heard from Becky or as soon as she got home, she would let her know that he was trying to get a hold of her. And with that, Luke left. Although Becky never actually returned home that night and her family didn't hear from her. But to be honest, they didn't really think much of it at the time. They just assumed that she had decided to stay at a friend's house that night, which wasn't out of the ordinary. She would often stay at her friend's. But then the next day rolled around, the 20th of February, and that was when alarm bells started to ring. Becky didn't return home that morning either. And in the afternoon of the 20th, all of Becky's friends and her boyfriend Luke showed up at her home. And when they realized that Becky wasn't there, she wasn't home, they basically said to her stepmom, Angie, we're really worried about Becky. None of us have seen or heard from her in more than 24 hours. She's not picking up the phone or responding to text messages or anything. And so of course, Angie started to worry as well because she and Darren had assumed that Becky was just with a friend. But here were her friends on her doorstep saying that they hadn't seen her. So where was she? Where was Becky? As soon as her friends arrived, Angie got in touch with her husband Darren at work and she told him about Becky. So he immediately left work and he drove home and after a quick search of her bedroom, Darren noticed that nothing nothing really seemed to be out of place. Her room looked pretty normal. There were a few things of Becky's that had gone, like her phone and her laptop seemed to be missing. But other than that, everything was normal, which really just added to the confusion. This was so out of Becky's character to just not keep in touch with people, but also to just be out on her own because of her social anxiety. And after ringing her phone repeatedly and still getting no answer, her father Darren decided that it was time to get in contact with the police and report his 16 year old daughter as missing. Darren rang the police at around 4pm that afternoon and a few hours later officers arrived. They took quick statements from the family about the last time everyone saw Becky, how she seemed the last time they saw her and then her father Darren made a post on Facebook. He put up a picture of Becky and said that she was missing and he just begged for any information on her whereabouts and the post quickly gained a lot of attention. So many people shared it and reposted it. News of Becky's disappearance spread very rapidly around the area and surrounding areas. And it was the following day, the 21st of February, when the police investigation, I think, really took off. Now, in a big city like Bristol, a teenager going missing isn't something that is totally out of the ordinary. Many teenagers in the Bristol area are reported as missing every single year. And usually, it's not that serious. More often than not, they turn up within 24 hours or so, and there is a reasonable explanation. But what seemed so odd to the detectives in Becky's case was the fact that there had been absolutely no activity from her phone. As I said, she wasn't responding to calls and text messages, and it was also determined that she hadn't been active at all on any of her social media platforms. But it seemed as though she had taken her phone with her wherever she went so why wasn't she using it? And you've got to remember that she was a teenage girl. She was normally glued to that phone so again why had there been no activity from it? I think it was after that realisation when the 
police also really started to worry that maybe something sinister had happened to Becky. About three, four days after she was last seen, the Avon and Somerset police decided to do a public appeal alongside Becky's father, Darren, and her grandmother, Pat. And during this appeal, they begged for information regarding Becky's whereabouts. And they also appealed directly to Becky on the off chance that maybe she was somehow watching the appeal. Bex, if you are watching this, please come home. We love you so much. You're so loved, and I don't think you believe that. You really are so loved. And if you call that, please come home or whoever's shelter in there, do what I think. Again, her family and friends and even the police were turning to social media. They were trying to spread awareness of Becky's case. There was even a hashtag going around on social media called Find Becky. And like I said at the start of the video, I vividly remember seeing all of this on social media at the time. I live fairly close to Bristol, so I remember seeing the missing posters and sharing them online and just how, just how big this case was. Everyone knew about the disappearance of Becky Watts. Posters were put up around Bristol, Becky's case was featured in many newspapers and yet despite all of this, despite everyone looking for her, there was nothing, no sign of her, no reported sightings. It wasn't long, of course, before search parties formed to start looking for Becky. Police officers themselves were out searching the local area, but also I think just members of the local community came together to help with the search. They were searching fields and woodlands, as well as gardens. Dive teams were sent in to search local ponds and rivers, just anywhere and everywhere that they could. Becky's father, Darren, continued to do a pit and interviews, TV interviews, radio interviews. He was still pleading for help on social media. He was doing everything that he could to spread the word and try to get his daughter home safe and well. And I believe it was around the 25th of February when the police decided that they needed to conduct a forensic search of Becky's home. By now it was coming up to a week since she was last seen and they still had no clue where she was or whether she was even still alive. So although this was still a missing persons inquiry, it was looking like foul play potentially could have been involved in her disappearance. So Becky's parents, Darren and Angie, were asked to leave the property and a forensic team was sent in. And in the meantime, as everything else was going on, Becky's family and friends were being called in to the police station one by one to be interviewed. Firstly, to build up a picture of the kind of girl that Becky was and what her life was like, but also to determine whether or not anyone in Becky's life could have actually had any involvement in whatever had happened to her. And of course, two of the people that were interviewed were Becky's older stepbrother, Nathan, and Nathan's girlfriend, Shauna Hall. Now, in their interviews, they obviously informed the police that they had been in the house on the day that Becky disappeared. And Shauna informed them that although she didn't actually see Becky leave, she did hear the front door slam, and she believed that that was Becky. And it seemed as though that was the last kind of sighting of Becky. Obviously, it wasn't an actual sighting it was just a noise but that was the last time anyone kind of knew of Becky's whereabouts. Shauna provided the last sighting of her. Shauna actually said that at the time she thought Becky might have been in a bit of a bad mood or something when she left because of the fact that she slammed the door but there was something about Shauna's interview in particular that I think kind of stood out to the detectives and that was the fact that she was quite Giggly. Um, can you tell us your full name, please? Um, it's Shauna Stacy Charmaine Hoare. Okay. Just scroll up down. When she was going through the events of that day, what she could remember, she would often giggle a little bit, which seemed weird. I mean, maybe it was nerves, nervous laughter, but, you know, she's in the police station because her, I guess, almost sister-in-law is missing and has been missing for days, so... Like, what's funny about this situation? Her boyfriend, Nathan, on the other hand, in his interview, he seemed very calm and relaxed and laid back, which, again, kind of stood out a little bit because unlike the rest of the family, he didn't seem to be 
too upset or worried about Becky. But all in all, their accounts from the day in question seemed to match up pretty well. They were both consistent and the police had no incriminating evidence against either of them. However, during the forensic search of the house where Becky lived, which was obviously going on as all of these interviews were taking place, the forensic team actually found something very worrying in Becky's room. Well, not exactly inside her room, more so on her door frame leading into her bedroom. You see, on the door frame, they found traces of blood, little tiny spots of blood in different areas on the door frame. And when tested, it was later determined that this blood had come from Becky. So the police began thinking, was there some kind of struggle in Becky's doorway? If she had been attacked and possibly even even killed, did the crime take place in her own bedroom or in the entryway to her bedroom? Could that explain why her blood was on the door frame? But blood wasn't the only thing the forensic team found. They also discovered, actually in some of these blood spots, some fingerprints. There were fingerprints in this blood, but whose prints were they? Well, scientists, of course, wanted to take samples and analyse them in order to find out. Meanwhile, as they were waiting for the results of these tests to come back, Becky's stepbrother Nathan and his girlfriend Shauna were brought back in to be interviewed once again. You see, the police were very suspicious of them by this point because like I just said, this blood in Becky's doorway indicated that something had happened to her in the house in her bedroom and Nathan and Shauna were the only two people also in the house at the same time Becky was that day and as we know Shauna claimed that she heard Becky leave but the thing is Becky was never seen on any CCTV after she supposedly left the house that day and there were no confirmed reported sightings of her and evidence blood evidence suggests that Becky may have been attacked in the home so it was looking like that may have been a lie. Nathan and Shauna were lying in their version of events. Evidence suggested that Becky never actually left the house that day. So detectives brought them back in, they started interviewing them, and what's interesting is that in Nathan's interviews, the detective started asking him some questions about his relationship with Becky, and he said that he didn't even like her. He didn't like his own stepsister. He said that he didn't like Becky because he claimed that she could be quite rude and moody sometimes. He said that Becky would be rude to his mum, Angie, a lot, Becky's stepmom, and that angered him. Mm. Didn't particularly talk to her, but obviously I don't particularly like her. And obviously what annoys me is the way she speaks to like my mum sometimes. Mm. She'd be kind of like rude or whatever, I'm trying to think of an actual specific time. Um, uh, has, he, has Nathan had any? Sort of concerns about speaking to us. Not that he's told me now. No. No. Okay. If he does, I wouldn't know then. <laughs> So it became clear to the police that Nathan and Becky didn't have a very good relationship. They would argue quite often, but of course that's not hard evidence that he did anything to her. All siblings bicker and argue, so the police didn't really have anything concrete to prove that Nathan or Shauna had any involvement in Becky's disappearance. So once again, after this interview, the couple were free to go and the investigation continued. Although it actually wasn't long after this when the police had a huge breakthrough in the case. They were contacted by the forensic team who informed them that they had identified whose fingerprints were in Becky's blood on her doorframe. The fingerprints belonged to her older stepbrother, 28-year-old Nathan Matthews. And it was after receiving these test results when the detectives became convinced that Nathan had done something to Becky. The fact that his fingerprints were found in her blood spots on this door, not just on the door, in her blood on the door. That indicated that he and Becky had been involved in some kind of 
violent struggle that took place in her bedroom and so the decision was made to, to arrest him arrest nathan matthews on suspicion of kidnap he wasn't arrested for murder because still the police didn't know for definite that becky was dead so he was arrested on suspicion of kidnap alongside his girlfriend 21 year old shauna hall she was also arrested and this happened on the 28th of february 2015 a week and two days after Becky went missing and it was after their arrest when of course the police had to inform Nathan and Becky's parents Darren and Angie that they believed that this was probably a murder inquiry and that Nathan and Shauna were the prime suspect and as you can imagine this was such a devastating shock for darren and angie they could not believe it literally when the police first told them they could not believe that it was true that nathan might have been capable of murdering his own little sister and i cannot even comprehend how hard that must have been for them to try and come to terms with to try and even wrap their head around following their arrest they were obviously both taken to the police station where they were questioned once again and shauna in her questioning just stuck to the same story that she was in the house that day she thought that she heard becky leave and that was it that was all she knew have you got any concerns or suspicions that nathan or any other member of your family or extended family might be responsible for her disappearance. No. <sighs> no. Why are you so sure? Because none of them is like would do anything like that. Is there anything that happened that could be significant in the disappearance of Rebecca? No. Are you absolutely sure? Yes. But the detectives did not believe her. And they even said that. They said to Shauna that they know that she knows more about this than she's letting on. But still, she would not waver from her story. I know you've got mm. something to tell us. Mm. I can see it in your face. I was just making sure there was nothing, like a weird significant thing that I hadn't thought of. Um, but I don't know anything. And it was the same with Nathan. He would not give in. He would not admit to anything. He was still sticking to the same story that Shauna had. Their accounts were the exact same. So it seemed as though they'd probably gone over their stories together beforehand they had agreed to tell the same story and stick together so because both of them clearly had no intention of telling the truth the police decided to search the couple's home to see if they could find any more evidence linking them to the crime because at this point all they had evidence wise was nathan's fingerprint in becky's blood and they needed more than that they needed their case against them to be as strong as possible if they were ever going to charge them and take them to trial. Nathan and Shauna lived together in a house on Cotton Mill Lane in Bristol which is just over a mile away from where Becky lived in Crown Hill St George and I believe they lived there with Nathan's grandparents or grandmother and also their young child. Nathan and Shauna actually had a child together although there isn't much information out there about this child for obvious reasons. I don't even know whether it was a boy or a girl but anyway the police and a forensic team went into the house and in all honesty it was a complete and utter mess there was just stuff everywhere it was so cluttered even getting into the house was difficult for the police they struggled to open the front door because there were just two random fridge freezers behind the door there was just so much stuff in every single room most of the rooms were filled to the top with items with their belongings every room was a mess every room except it seemed the bathroom bathroom upstairs well half of the bathroom was a mess half of it was also filled with stuff apparently there was an oven and a microwave that had just been left in there you couldn't get to the sink but then incredibly when you kind of panned around the room the other half 
was immaculate. The bath in particular was exceptionally clean. Now this very, very much stood out to the detectives, the fact that the bath in particular was so clean, because when I say it was clean, I mean clean. It was literally spotless and gleaming. In fact, it looked as though it had very recently been meticulously scrubbed and washed with cleaning chemicals. And of course this stood out because the rest of the house was the complete opposite. It was so dirty and messy and yet the bathtub and shower almost looked brand new it was that clean so it was at this point that the detective started theorizing that maybe the bathroom in their home might have been a crime scene maybe if they killed becky or if nathan killed becky they put her body in this bathtub whilst they figured out what to do with her maybe on the day that she vanished they kidnapped her from her home and drove her to the house and there was a violent struggle in the bathroom now because the bath was so spotless and had clearly been cleaned forensics didn't actually find anything in there any trace of blood or any of becky's dna but whilst they didn't find any additional forensic evidence they did find something else in their home which provided the police with another potential lead. I believe it was about two days after the search of their home began when they found some receipts. Now these receipts were from a shop called B&Q. B&Q is a hardware store that we have here in the UK and the date on these receipts was the 20th of February 2015, the day after Becky went missing and the items that have been bought from B&Q, the items listed on this receipt were very alarming to the police. The receipt showed that the person who went to B&Q that day had purchased some gloves, some goggles, a face mask and also a circular saw. So the police went to this B&Q and they checked the CCTV from that day and through doing this they were able to determine that it was Becky's stepbrother Nathan that went and brought those items. Apparently he was even asking the staff in their questions about the saw that he was buying. He was comparing the ones that they had in stock and asking you know which one was the best, which one was the strongest etc. And in addition to the CCTV evidence from the B Q, the police also eventually obtained CCTV footage of both Nathan and Shauna in another shop but buying cleaning products following Becky's disappearance as well as some other items such as black bags and cling film. And it was following the discovery of this evidence when on the 2nd of March 2015, both of them were rearrested, this time on suspicion of the murder of Becky Watts. Even though her body still had not been found, the police were confident that Becky was dead. She had been the victim of a homicide. Now, when they were rearrested and their interviews continued, the police didn't actually tell them what evidence they had obtained against them. They wanted to keep that information back for now. So they didn't tell them about the B&Q receipt discovery or the CCTV footage or the fact that Nathan's fingerprint had been found in Becky's blood on her door frame. They didn't tell them any of that, although they did tell Nathan that they had sent forensic teams in to search his house. I think just so that he knew that the detectives were onto him, so that he felt very under pressure, because perhaps that would push him into doing something or saying something incriminating. Maybe he would even confess. And you know what? In the end, that is exactly what happened. Late in the evening, on the same day the couple were rearrested, the 2nd of March 2015, about 11 days after Becky was last seen alive, 28-year-old Nathan Matthews made a confession to the police. Alongside his lawyer, he prepared a statement in which he confessed to being responsible for the death of his stepsister, Becky. Although he denied murdering her, he claimed that her her death was an accident. Very helpfully, um, we've been provided with a prepared written statement. And um, what we would like to do now, Nathan, is for that to be told on the interview recording. Do I have to actually listen to it? Can I put my fingers in my ears? Yep, I'll do that, thank you. <laughs> 
I have his statement here to read for you. I believe the full statement is a little bit longer than this. This is kind of the condensed version. So it says, I, Nathan Charles Matthew, accept that I'm responsible for the death of Rebecca Watts. On the 19th of February 2015, I attended Crown Hill at St George, Bristol with my girlfriend Shauna Hall. In my car, I had a large bag, a stun device, handcuffs, tape and mask. I developed an idea to scare Rebecca by kidnapping her. I wanted to scare her and teach her a lesson. I believed that she was selfish and her behaviour towards my mother was a risk to her house. A few minutes after arriving, Shauna said that she wanted a cigarette and went into the garden. I went to the boot of my car, took out a bag that contained the items, then went upstairs to the landing before knocking on Rebecca's door. She replied, what or hello? And I said, can I see you a minute? I cannot be sure which order things happened, but I used the items that I had to subdue Rebecca. During the short struggle, my mask slipped and Rebecca was able to see my face. This caused me to panic and I strangled her while she was partially in the bag. So that was Nathan's statement. That was his confession. And I say confession because the majority of people do not believe that this confession was 100% truthful, that this was just a kidnap plot that went wrong, but we'll get into that shortly. After he gave his statement, Nathan Matthews then told the police what he did with Becky's body. He admitted that he had used the circular saw that he had purchased from B&Q to dismember her. He dismembered his own little sister. After he killed her in her house, he put her body in a suitcase and then he put this suitcase in his car. He later drove to his home. He carried Becky to the bathtub and that's where the dismemberment took place. After he cut her up into several different pieces, he wrapped up her remains in cling film and put them into bags and boxes. I believe he also covered her body parts in cat litter because because he thought that that would help to mask the smell of a dead body. And then he actually took the body parts to a friend's house. Their names were Carl Demetrius and his girlfriend, Jadine Parsons, and they lived in Barton Hill in Bristol. And apparently Nathan offered them both a large sum of money if they agreed to let him hide something in their garden shed and they did, they agreed. Although they claimed that they were completely unaware of what exactly it was that Nathan wanted them to hide, he didn't tell them. Matthews also said that two other men helped him to transport the bags containing the body parts to the shed. Again, apparently they were completely unaware of what exactly was in these bags. One of these men was actually Carl Demetrius's brother Donovan, and the other man was named James Ireland. So both James and Donovan were eventually charged in relation to this crime. However, they were ultimately cleared of this charge. They were not convicted, although Carl and Jadine were, but we'll talk about that a little later on in the video. Just the day after Nathan's confession, on the 3rd of March, the police went to Carl and Jadine's house and sure enough, inside their garden shed, they found human body parts. They were recovered and taken to the medical examiner who determined that Nathan had cut Becky up into roughly eight or nine separate pieces, her head being one of them. He actually decapitated her. It was determined in her post-mortem that Becky's cause of death was suffocation, but she also had several other injuries to her body, at least 40 other injuries. She was absolutely covered in bruises and self-defense injuries from where she tried so, so hard to fight back, fight for her life. But she had also sustained a lot of stab wounds as well. It was determined that after her death, Nathan had actually stabbed her in the abdomen 15 times, which of course doesn't quite add up with the accident story that he was trying to tell. If he really didn't mean to kill her, why the hell did he stab her 15 15 times after she was dead. Let's get into the whole accident story actually. So as we know from the statement, Nathan's story was that he never intended to kill Becky. He never meant for her to die. He claimed that he basically just wanted to abduct her and teach her a lesson because in his opinion she was spoiled and rude and ungrateful and she, in his words, quote, needed to be more appreciative of life. So he decided to take it upon himself to 
I guess, discipline her in his own sick way. I think he said that his plan was to abduct her and take her to a forest somewhere where he would threaten her. But as he was trying to kidnap her, he claimed that he panicked and strangled her. I believe he claimed that he was just trying to strangle her into unconsciousness, but instead he actually killed her he strangled her to death honestly in a way to me it kind of sounds like he's trying to blame becky for her own death it was becky's fault that she died because if she hadn't been so rude and ungrateful for things in life then he wouldn't have had to do what he did he wouldn't have had to teach her a lesson if she wasn't the way she was if she wasn't such a bad person but i mean in reality he was the bad person that he was describing he was saying all these things about how horrible Becky was when in actual fact he was so nasty he was an awful person he was a bully to Becky in Becky's father Darren's book he describes how Nathan never really liked Becky from the moment that she first came into his life when she was around two three years old and he was 14 he pretty much hated her like I mentioned earlier being the youngest being just a toddler Becky often required more attention from her parents from Darren and her stepmom Angie than Nathan and their other brother Danny did. That's just how it works in families. As one of five children, I can safely say that my youngest brother always did receive the most attention from my parents because he needed them the most. But Nathan almost hated Becky for this. He was so jealous whenever his mum Angie would spend time with Becky. And even as they both got older, even when Nathan was an adult, I don't think this jealousy ever really went away. If you remember, he claimed in his statement that Becky treated Angie like dirt. She would leave things out for Angie to trip over, she would leave the house a mess, and he was worried as her son that it would make her health, her MS, worse. But to be honest, if anything, from what I've read, it was the opposite. It was Nathan that treated his mum awfully. Apparently, he would call Angie a, quote, fucking idiot, and he would joke about it with Shauna. Even though his mum had done so much for him, both Darren and Angie had, right up until this case occurred, Nathan's parents had financially supported both Nathan and Shauna for years. They had to give Nathan money quite a lot for food and clothes and stuff because he would never really get a proper job, so he couldn't afford anything but yeah so if anything from what I can gather it was Nathan who treated Angie badly not Becky. Angie and Becky always had a very very good loving relationship. I'm sure they would bicker and argue every now and then but what mother and daughter don't argue occasionally. But the person that Nathan treated the worst out of everyone in his family was of course Becky. Like I mentioned he was literally just a bully to her. He would call her ugly and fat literally while she was going through her eating disorder when she was just 12 years old. When she was literally anorexic, he was calling her fat. And I cannot even... I can't even begin to imagine just how much of an impact that must have had on her. Just how much damage those words did to her mental state. She was already being bullied at school by horrible girls and now she was also being bullied by her own big brother. He also accused Becky of just making it all up for attention. He claimed that her anorexia was just her desperate attempt at getting more attention and that she was enjoying it. She was enjoying watching every everyone worry about her. Another way that Nathan would bully Becky is he would just try to frighten the life out of her all the time. There were so many occasions where he would jump out and try to scare her and you know we've all done that to someone before. We've all gone boo when we hear someone coming just for a quick laugh but Nathan was doing it so often to Becky to the point where it wasn't funny anymore. It got to a point where it was starting to traumatized Becky. I believe he even threatened to kill Becky at one point. He told her in detail exactly how he would kill her. Nathan just terrified her so much that during one of her counselling sessions, which she had often while she was going through her eating disorder, she actually told her counsellor that she didn't always feel safe when she was around him. She didn't feel safe around her older brother. And in Becky's father Darren's book, he does talk about 
how now when he looks back at all of these horrible things that Nathan did to Becky, he can see just how vile he was to her. Back then when these things were happening, he just put it down to sibling rivalry. He just thought that they would argue and bicker like any other siblings do. But on reflection, he can see that there was another side to it. He can see that the way Nathan treated Becky wasn't just, you know, him being a bit of a twatty older brother sometimes. It was a lot more sinister than that. It was bullying. Nathan was bullying Becky and just terrorising her. But I went a little bit off track there. So going back to Nathan's statement, something else that he claimed during his confession was that his girlfriend, Shauna Hall, had absolutely no involvement in what happened to Becky. He claimed that Shauna was not involved in Becky's death or the dismemberment and that she had no clue that Nathan did any of this. She was none the wiser that Becky was dead and that she had been killed by Nathan. However, I'm sure you know what's coming. The detectives did not believe this for a second. They did not believe that Shauna knew nothing about this. How could she not have known? She was literally in the house that day when Nathan was attacking Becky. Well, he claimed and Shauna claimed that she was out in the garden smoking a cigarette at the time. But we know from Becky's injuries that there was a very violent struggle between the two. So how did Shauna not hear that? And Let's just say for argument's sake that she didn't hear it. Well, how did Nathan get Becky's body into his car without Shauna knowing. Nathan said that he put Becky's body into a bag or a suitcase or something after she died and if that's true that bag would have been extremely heavy. Would Shauna not have seen him really struggling with carrying this heavy bag on his own down a flight of stairs and not questioned him on it? Would she not have asked him what the hell is in that bag? I mean would Nathan have really been able to carry a bag containing a dead body on his own. It seems more than likely that he would have needed some help with that and Shauna was the only other person in the house at the time that could have helped. As we know, Nathan took Becky's body back to his house where he lived with Shauna and there he dismembered her in the bathtub. So again, how did he do that? How did he use a circular saw to cut Becky up without Shauna knowing. It makes absolutely no sense. Another thing that indicates that Shauna knew was obviously the CCTV footage that we talked about earlier. Both she and Nathan went to the shop and they bought a load of cleaning products after Becky would have been killed and we know that the bathtub where she had been dismembered had been thoroughly thoroughly cleaned and they also bought black bin bags and loads of cling film and we know that Becky's body had been wrapped up in cling film. So the facts of the case suggest that even if Shauna wasn't involved in Becky's actual death, she surely at least helped with the cleanup and the cover-up. Maybe she even helped to dismember Becky's body and wrap up her body part. Shauna, in her questioning, was of course denying this. She maintained her innocence and said that she had no idea that any of this had gone on. What's your knowledge of him killing Becky? I found out yesterday morning. You found out yesterday morning? Um, prior to that, I had no idea that he had any involvement in anything at all. And how do we know you weren't involved in the, the killing of Becky? Because there would be no proof. But the police didn't believe her. What they believed was that Shauna and Nathan were in this together and that they had made a plan that if it got to a certain point, if the police found solid evidence, Nathan would confess and he would claim that Shauna was innocent and Shauna would just go along with that. She would get off scot-free. Meanwhile, whilst the detectives were still questioning Shauna, other detectives were trying to get more information out of Nathan because he was still sticking to his story that Becky's death was an accident, a kidnap plot that went wrong. So they began trying to ask him questions questions about the moment that Becky actually died but he wouldn't say anything. He wouldn't cooperate. He was just crying and he kept saying no comment. As Becky stood up Nathan whilst you were strangling her. No comment. <clears throat> to what degree was she incapacitated then? No comment. Was she conscious at the time that you strangled her? No, no comment. 
In the days that followed, both Nathan and Shauna were charged in relation to this crime. Now, Nathan was, of course, charged with murder, whereas Shauna was just charged with perverting the course of justice. The detectives wanted to charge her with murder like Nathan because they wholeheartedly believed that she was involved and she was in on it. But at this point in the investigation, they didn't have the evidence to prove it. So whilst they continued looking for evidence which linked Shauna to the crime, they just charged her with perverting the course of justice so that they could keep her detained for the time being. And so the investigation continued and one thing the police decided to do during their search for additional evidence was look into both Nathan and Shauna's electronic devices, so their computers and their laptops and their phones, just to see if there was anything incriminating on there. And as it turns out, there was. There was a lot of evidence recovered from their devices. On Nathan's laptop, they discovered a pornographic video of a teenager around the same age as Becky being violently raped. So it was then when detectives began thinking, could that have played a part in what he did to Becky? Could there have been a sexual motive to this crime? It was discovered actually that Nathan watched a lot of porn which was all to do with teenagers, teenage schoolgirls. He would watch it pretty much every single day. So it's clear that Nathan was attracted to young girls around Becky's age. I mean, when he started seeing Shauna in 2008, he was 21 years old and she was seven years younger than him. She was 14. She was a child, so he basically groomed her. And at the time, he tried to bring Shauna back to Angie and Darren's house, claiming that she was 19 years old, but Darren knew that she wasn't. You could tell from looking at Shauna that she was a lot younger than 19, and so he told Nathan to go away, basically. He said that he was not bringing her into the house until he could prove, through an ID or a birth certificate, that she was over the age of consent. And of course, Nathan couldn't prove that because Shauna wasn't at the time. He couldn't prove it until two years later in 2010, when she actually did turn 16. Shauna would later go on to claim that Nathan was incredibly abusive towards her throughout pretty much their entire relationship. She claimed that he was really, really controlling. He was very jealous when she was around other men. He was physically abusive and violent. She said that there were times when he would grab her by the hair and pull her. She said that he strangled her before he put his hands around her neck. She described how on one occasion after they had an argument, he jumped on her and using a fork, he just started stabbing himself in the chair. And of course, he was sexually abusive, at least in the first few years of their relationship because Shauna was just 14 years old when they started dating. She couldn't have consented to sex with him even if she wanted to, because it's illegal. And that kind of thing had happened numerous times, I believe. Even before Shauna, Nathan would try to date and bring home really, really young girls. I think some of them were even as young as like 12, 12 years old. And of course, Darren and Angie would never let him. They would tell him to turn around and take those girls back home to their parents. I'm not sure if the police were made aware of his behaviour at the time. I hope they were, because... Honestly, it's just disgusting. But in addition to the pornography discovery, the police also recovered some text messages, text messages between Shauna and Nathan. And these text messages were of the couple basically discussing their sexual fantasies that they shared in which they abducted and sexually assaulted teenage girls. And I came across some of the text messages between them in some news articles, so I'll just read them off quickly. I believe this particular text message exchange was from 2014, so just the year before Becky was killed. Nathan texted Shauna saying, quote, fuck you, bring me back two pretty schoolgirls then. To which Shauna replied saying, lol, yeah, I'll just kidnap them from school. And then later that same day, Shauna sent Nathan a message saying, quote, just went to Costcutter and saw a very pretty petite girl, almost knocked her out to bring home, lol, xoxo. Nathan responded to that saying, quote, don't you almost me, now fucking do it bitch. And Shauna said, quote, to LMFAO, yeah, I'll just go back in time to when I saw her, time travel with her to our attic, lol, xoxo. They both 
both of them wanted to kidnap a young teenage girl a child and take her back to the attic most likely with the intention of doing some truly sickening things to her and yeah like i said when the police discovered all of this they started thinking that perhaps there was a sexual element to this crime to becky's murder maybe nathan was actually attracted to his own stepsister Becky. I mean, she was in the same age bracket as the girls that he would usually fancy, the girls that he would watch in these porn videos. Maybe he actually intended to kidnap Becky that day, not because he wanted to teach her a lesson, but because he wanted to take her back to his attic, tie her up, and sexually assault her. But in the end, he couldn't. Becky was putting up too much of a fight, so he just killed her there and then. And maybe Shauna was in on it. These messages clearly indicate that she shared Nathan's sick and twisted fantasies about abducting a teenager. So maybe they both decided to make their fantasies a reality and kidnap Becky. The police did question Shauna about these text messages after they recovered them. However, Shauna would not say anything about them. She just said no comment. Just went to cost cutters and saw a very big cat's pretty, pretty petite girl. Almost knocked her out to bring her home. LOL and there's crosses and zeros. Shauna, what can you tell me about that? No comment. Am I right in thinking that this girl was similar to Becca's aid? No comment. But the text messages weren't the only thing that suggested that Shauna had a bigger part in this crime than she was letting on. Another thing the detectives discovered on Shauna's phone was that on the evening of the same day that Becky was killed, so this was after she was dead, Shauna had searched on YouTube, Do You Want to Hide a Body? Do You Want to Hide a Body is apparently a parody song of Do You Want to Build a Snowman from the Disney film Frozen. Just hours hours, hours after Becky was killed, Shauna had looked that song up on YouTube and she played it to Nathan. So what does that tell you? She was claiming that she had absolutely no idea what happened to Becky and yet just hours after she was murdered, she looked up the Do You Want to Hide a Body song. Could that really have just been a coincidence? But the strongest piece of evidence the police ultimately had when it came to linking Shauna directly to the crime was actually forensic evidence. Scientists eventually determined that Shauna's DNA was discovered on a face mask that had been hidden in the same garden shed where Becky's body parts had been hidden. The police believed that this was a face mask that had been used during the dismemberment. And as well as that, Shauna's DNA was also found on a bag that one of Becky's body parts had been placed in. And it was following the discovery of all of this evidence when in June of 2015, 21-year-old Shauna was also charged with murder. According to a few sources, both Nathan and Shauna also had other additional charges as well as murder. These included conspiracy to kidnap, preventing the lawful burial of a body and possession of an illegal weapon. That was the stun guns that they owned. And I believe they also had charges relating to owning indecent images of young girls and children. And both of them decided to plead not guilty. Shauna pleaded not guilty to every single one of her charges, including murder. Whereas Nathan pleaded guilty to most of his charges, except conspiracy to kidnap and murder. He pleaded not guilty to those. He tried to claim that it was manslaughter. Again, he maintained the story that Becky's death was an accident. He didn't intend to kill her. So obviously that meant that the both of them would have to go to trial and their trial began on the 6th of October 2015 at Bristol Crown Court. Of course, during the trial, Nathan's defence team stuck to his account that Becky's death was just the result of a kidnap plot gone wrong. However, the prosecution outlined all of the reasons why they believed that that was a lie and they ran through their theorised version of events, what they believed happened on the day of Becky's death based on the evidence. The prosecution said that on that fateful day, the 19th of February 2015, Nathan and Shauna left their home, they got in their car and they drove to the house where Becky lived and there is actually CCTV footage of them driving to the house. In the car, as we know, they basically had 
a kit, their own kidnap kit, which contained the stun gun, the tape, handcuffs. They intended to use these items to abduct Becky. And the prosecution believed that they wanted to abduct her because they wanted to use her to fulfill their shared twisted sexual fantasies. The evidence suggests that the attack started and ended in and around Becky's bedroom and when Becky started to fight back and defend herself she was suffocated and strangled to death. Once she was dead they put her body into a suitcase, put the suitcase into their car and then they actually left her there in the car as Angie and Darren eventually came home. When Darren and Angie came home, they obviously would have seen that Nathan and Shauna's car was parked outside, so they would have known that the couple were home. They would have walked past their car as they approached the front door, and they were completely unaware that Becky's dead body was inside of it. Nathan and Shauna stayed at Darren and Angie's house for most of the evening, whilst Becky's body remained outside in the car. They even ordered themselves a Chinese takeaway there, which they ate for dinner. And then eventually Shauna and Nathan left and they drove back to their address. Once they got back home, they put Becky's body in the bathtub and it's believed that it was then when Nathan got a knife and he stabbed Becky in the abdomen 15 times. He later claimed that he did that. He stabbed her because he thought that it would drain her body fluids. As we know, Nathan went out to the being Q shot the day after Becky was killed and there he purchased a circular saw amongst other items and using the saw he dismembered Becky's body and most people believe that Shauna assisted him with that part. They don't believe that he could have done it on his own. After they cut Becky's body into eight separate pieces the couple then used cling film to wrap up each piece. They put her remains into boxes and bags and suitcases and then they offered friends cold Demetrius and Jadine Parsons a large sum of money if they hid these bags and boxes in their garden shed which as we know they did following this Nathan and Shauna used a lot of cleaning chemicals to thoroughly clean their bathtub to get rid of evidence and then they just carried on with life as normal when Becky was reported as missing they pretended that they had no idea what had happened to her. They watched as Becky's family and friends were so distraught because they were so worried about her and they didn't know where she was. And the whole time, they knew Becky's whereabouts. They knew that she was dead and that her dismembered body was lying in a garden shed. The trial went on for about five weeks in total and on the 11th of November 2015 the jury went off to deliberate. When they returned after about three and a half hours they announced their verdict. The jury found 29 year old Nathan Matthews guilty of the kidnap and murder of his 16 year old stepsister Becky Watts. Shauna on the other hand was actually found not guilty of murder but guilty of manslaughter and she was also found guilty of perverting the course of justice, preventing a lawful burial and possession of a stun gun. And as I understand it, the reason she was not found guilty of murder was because there wasn't necessarily any concrete evidence linking her directly to Becky's death. There was enough evidence to convince the jury that Shauna was involved in the cleanup and the dismemberment but not evidence that she was involved in the actual attack. So she wasn't convinced convicted of murder. She was instead convicted of manslaughter and for her part in the crime, 21-year-old Shauna Hall was sentenced to 17 years in prison, whereas Nathan Matthews was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 33 years. Both Carl Demetrius and Jadine Parsons were convicted of assisting an offender because they obviously allowed Matthews to hide Becky's body in their shed. For this, Carl was ordered to serve two years in prison and Jadine was given a 16 month sentence. Apparently both Nathan and Shauna tried to appeal their sentences in 2016 but of course they were both rejected and prison is where they both remain to this day. Becky and Nathan's parents Darren and Angie are still together today. They're still married which I think says 
a lot about the strength of their relationship. I think after this happened to them, a lot of people expected that Darren and Angie would split because obviously it was Angie's son, Nathan, who killed Darren's daughter, Becky. But in all honesty, Becky was really just as much Angie's child as she was Darren's. Yes, they weren't biologically related, but that of course didn't matter. Angie loved Becky like she was her own daughter and she was just as destroyed as Darren was when Becky was killed and Angie and Darren have been each other's support system ever since even after Nathan tore their worlds apart they never stopped loving one another they never stopped being there for one another and that is it for this case that is the case of Becky Watts who actually became known as Bristol's angel after her death an incredibly tragic case Becky was just 16 years old she was still a child when her life and her whole future was cruelly taken away from her, taken away by someone that was supposed to love her and take care of her and protect her, her big brother. Please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. Thank you so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next time for another Mystery with Molly. Bye.